We certainly have become very, very familiar with this picture over the last uh, six months. It's a picture, of course, of the virus that is threatening to blow our world apart. And uh, life as we have known it has uh, essentially disappeared because of this pandemic. Well, we have had pandemics and epidemics in the past, and the two are not synonymous. What's the difference? An epidemic is, is relatively small scale when an infection spreads uh, among many people, but not globally. Whereas a pandemic uh, is geographic uh, and uh, many, many countries are involved. And unfortunately, this is just what we are uh, seeing now. Give you an example of an epidemic. Uh, in 1812, Napoleon had to withdraw from Russia because his army was getting sick and they were infested with body lice, and this, called, this caused epidemic uh, typhus. There are many other examples of typhus uh, in history, and uh, certainly, unfortunately, during the Second World War and concentration camps in Germany, uh, typhus was rampant. Uh, people were uh, full of, uh, of body lice, uh, and Frank died of, uh, of typhus. And the Warsaw Ghetto uh, was infected with body lice and a huge epidemic of typhus. But this is kind of interesting in our current context because there were a lot of doctors, a lot of Jewish doctors in the Warsaw Ghetto. And uh, they knew that if you could just separate people and keep them from contacting each other, you would reduce the spread of the disease. Of course, it was very difficult to do in the Warsaw Ghetto, but they did manage to put a... a, a stop to the epidemic. Unfortunately, most of the uh, people in the Warsaw Ghetto eventually were taken to concentration camps or, or just uh, killed when the ghetto was, was raised. But it's very interesting that um, at that time, they already were aware of this business of, of uh, social distancing. But of course, it was very difficult to do in the, uh, in the Warsaw Ghetto. Much more recently, of course, we had the SARS uh, uh, outbreak epidemic in, in 2003. And we've also had pandemics in the past. Black Death or, you know, the infamous uh, bubonic plague in the 14th century uh, killed a lot of people in, um, in Europe. And this was a disease that was transmitted by fleas. And the fleas generally lived on rodents, on, on, on rats. And uh, it was um, absolutely devastating. Doctors uh, tried to combat the disease by wearing masks. Now, it's not because they thought that it was transmitted through the air. They didn't know that. Uh, they didn't know about fleas or in any way how it was transmitted. But they knew that there was a stench in the air from all the, the people who were sick and dying. So they wore these masks, which were filled with aromatic herbs, so that they wouldn't have to smell the illness all around them. But interestingly enough, in Venice, in, in Italy, they did come to a conclusion that the disease was being uh, imported by sailors, and they actually initiated a quarantine. They didn't allow sailors off of the, the ships, and they had to stay on there for 40 days, which is where our term quarantine uh, comes from. There were some sad uh, sidelights uh, to these quarantines and, and, and the plague, is that very often innocent people were blamed for spreading it. And uh, as usual, Jews were blamed, and uh, there were burnings of Jewish communities because uh, it was thought that they were spreading the disease, which of course was absolute nonsense. And then much more recently, we had the uh, HIV, the AIDS uh, uh, pandemic. This was caused by uh, a virus, the HIV uh, uh, virus. So historically, we've had to deal with a lot. But the one that is most relevant to us now in terms of a pandemic is the one that took place in 1919. And that, of course, was the Spanish influenza, although it did not start in Spain, but a lot of publicity was generated when it went to Spain, mostly from, from the U.S. In any case, uh, interestingly uh, enough, the measures taken then were very similar to what we see today. Churches, schools, and shows were closed. Mask wearing was made compulsory. And sometimes, uh, you know, uh, there were activists out there telling everyone to wear a mask, but not everybody listened. And there were some heavy-handed approaches to this as well. Well, so far, we've not had that 
here, uh, but we're starting to initiate uh, fines for people who don't wear, uh, wear masks. Outdoor activities were encouraged. Uh, beauty salons and, and barbers moved out, outdoors. Uh, there were tests for fever, very much like what we are seeing today. And unfortunately, just like we're seeing today, there were a lot of people who, who died. Uh, there were all kinds of consequences. The Stanley Cup finals were canceled because of, of the flu. And if you look on the Stanley Cup today, it will tell you that in 1920, the Montreal Canadiens and the Seattle Metropolitans uh, had to quit the series. And this is the only time that the Stanley Cup was not uh, uh, awarded. And of course, we have seen a parallel recently uh, when the NHL season was, uh, was put on, uh, on hold. Well, interestingly enough, back then, very much like today, there were public health advocates. And Dr. Thomas Dyer Tuttle was one of these. And uh, he wrote a number of articles about how to handle uh, the situation and how to keep away from each other, how to wear masks, uh, etc. And these articles were, were popular. They were carried in many, many newspapers. People were told to avoid crowds, uh, don't spit on the floor or the sidewalk, avoid excess fatigue, very much like we're talking about uh, today. Uh, keep doors and windows open because it was understood that, that as air circulated, it reduced the, the risk of, of infection. Uh, there were disinfectants like Lysol that, that were widely promoted. So again, very similar to, to today. And also, unfortunately, similar to today, there were people who defied Dr. Tuttle, who didn't believe that all of this was necessary. And the parallel today, of course, is Dr. Anthony Fauci, one of the world's leading experts on infectious diseases. But again, uh, he is not always believed, especially in the U.S. We are seeing demonstrations suggesting that Fauci was, was wrong. Uh, just a couple of days ago, Dr. Fauci uh, informed us that uh, it's very unlikely that we're going to see an end of this business before 2021 uh, is over. Uh, who knows? Uh, I don't have a crystal ball to tell you what will happen. Well, actually, that's not true. I do have a crystal ball. And uh, what do I see in my crystal ball? Uh, unfortunately, I see the virus. And it's going to be with us, I think, for, uh, for a while. There's going to be no simple solution. I mean, the 1918-1919 uh, the uh, pandemic uh, sort of ground to a halt in 1920 after enough people had died and sort of herd immunity uh, developed. And this is just what may happen now unless we really pay attention and learn the lesson uh, from those days uh, about masking, about social distancing, and about how then all of those measures at first were thought to be exaggerated, but later considered to be insufficient. Uh, many times we have learned that if we don't understand and learn from history, it will repeat itself. And we're kind of seeing that now with the uh, current uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Okay, well, let's discuss this in, in some detail because, of course, COVID-19 makes for uh, certainly a, a very interesting story. Where do we start? Well, let's go all the way across the globe to, to China and the province of Wuhan, uh, which is where this pandemic is believed to have started. There's good evidence for that, but, but uh, we can't say it with 100% certainty uh, unfortunately, we can't say anything with 100% certainty when it comes to this uh, virus. But we know that uh, uh, just around the turn of, of last year, uh, the first outbreak was noted in Wuhan. It was a special kind of pneumonia. It sickened a lot of people. But at that time, it didn't get a whole lot of uh, attention. Eventually, the problem was traced to what was called the wet market in, in Wuhan, called a wet market because uh, the floor was constantly being washed because of all the blood and the guts uh, that were uh, being spewed out there when animals and, and fish were being butchered. And this is where the virus uh, is thought to have jumped from some sort of animal uh, to the human. 
these wet markets are popular because there is a belief in China uh, associated with traditional Chinese medicine that there are certain foods and animal byproducts that are particularly healthy. And uh, of course, uh, in, in uh, areas of China where you don't have modern medicine, uh, people will try to uh, abide by these traditional uh, methods. And unfortunately, it is these methods that are thought to have initiated the current uh, uh, pandemic, uh, specifically in this particular wet market, which has, of course, been uh, now closed, uh, closed down. And uh, of course, there are other theories as well. Uh, there's a theory going around that, in fact, the virus did not come from that market, but it escaped from some kind of virology uh, lab. And indeed, in Wuhan, there is the Wuhan Institute of Virology, where they do very intense and very sophisticated research on viruses. And this has been looked into extensively. And uh, we now know, because of the genetic makeup of this virus, experts tell us that it is not possible that this would have been concocted in, in the laboratory. But nevertheless, this um, uh, conspiracy theory uh, still uh, has uh, a great deal of, of, of life. Well, the Chinese, though, uh, can't be let off totally, uh, can't be let off the hook totally, because it is true that in the beginning of this pandemic, uh, they did keep some information away from the public. And Dr. Li Wen Liang, uh, who first um, uh, brought this uh, uh, problem to the notice of the authorities, uh, basically was silenced. And he was not allowed to uh, talk about it. Unfortunately, he himself died of uh, COVID-19. But certainly in the beginning, the uh, Chinese authorities did try to uh, keep some aspects of this uh, secret. But uh, of course, it turned out that it wasn't possible to totally keep it secret because people were getting sick, people were dying, so they had to take measures. And their measures were effective. They initiated a total close down of Wuhan. And uh, uh, in China, that worked because people, of course, do as the government tells them. But nevertheless, the pandemic began to spread around the world. It went to Italy with devastating results. Uh, France and other countries in Europe also began to uh, experience it. And then the World Health Organization eventually uh, declared that we were looking at a global uh, pandemic. And uh, people started to take notice in India, some real strong arm measures. Anyone who was caught outside during a lockdown was punished. And uh, the civil defense authorities here, you can see with their stick, were getting ready to beat these men who had defied the lockdown. And they were uh, made to, to uh, crouch down in the way that you see and hang on to their earlobes and repeatedly say, I will not, uh, I will go home and stay uh, indoors. Uh, that worked in India, wouldn't work as well here. But in North America as well, we started to see some lockdowns. Grand Central Station in, in New York uh, looked totally different from the way that it looked uh, most days. And unfortunately, we began to see these refrigerated trucks, which were mortuaries because uh, hospitals were running out of space to store all of the uh, dead bodies. Question is, how on earth did this happen? How did we come to this stage? Again, there are numerous theories uh, that, that go around, and one that you probably heard of is that people were eating bat soup in China. No, this is, is nonsense, although the picture that scooted around the internet did show uh, an Asian lady eating uh, a bat, and it is true that, that bats are eaten in that part of the world. It's not common, but rarely. And this was actually a, a tourist documentary show, and it wasn't even in China. So it had absolutely nothing to do with the uh, COVID. This picture was taken uh, two years before we ever heard anything about um, uh, COVID-19. So this is just nonsense. It doesn't mean, though, that bats uh, have not played a role. It seems that bat poop may have played a role because the virus seems to have originated in, in, in bats. Many viruses do because uh, bats live in very, very 
a close uh, environment. There are thousands and thousands who live together in caves and, and viruses get transmitted between them very easily. And uh, it didn't come from eating of the bats, but it seems that the bat poop did contaminate some animals and those animals were vectors to, to humans. And the animal that is being blamed uh, mostly is the pangolin. It's ra this rather strange looking creature, it looks like an anteater. And in the wet markets in China, all kinds of strange animals are sold, again, because of the belief that they have various health properties. And it's thought that this is how the virus jumped uh, uh, from bat poop to the animal and from the animal to, uh, to humans. Again, as with everything else, we don't know this absolute certainty, uh, but there's pretty good evidence that that's how, the, uh, how this happened. So about this virus, well, first thing that uh, we have to establish that sometimes you will hear expressions about a virus being alive or dead. A virus is never alive. It's not a living species. It needs to invade a living cell in order to uh, multiply. So when you hear the term the virus is killed, that's kind of a colloquial use. What it really means is that somehow the virus has been stopped from uh, uh, re replicating itself. This is again a classic picture of the virus and those yellow outcroppings are proteins. And uh, those very special uh, proteins, they're called spike proteins, naturally, because they look like spikes. That's what the virus uses to attach itself to a cell before it can enter the cell and infect it. But if we were to look inside of this virus, inside we see its genetic material, which is ribose nucleic acid. This is what it uses to reproduce by introducing that into the uh, genome of a cell that it infects. So the virus is a rather primitive creature. It isn't alive, but it can replicate uh, after infecting a cell. So how does this happen? Those spike proteins that we saw on the, uh, on the virus will attach themselves to specific receptors on a cell. These are called the ACE2 receptors, and it's very much like a, a hand fitting into a glove or a key fitting into a lock. And when the spike protein fits into that receptor, then the uh, virus has the ability to enter the cell where it will unload its genetic material, its RNA, incorporate that into the uh, cell, into the DNA of the cell, and the cell will then start to reproduce all the components that are needed for the virus to replicate. So the virus replicates inside of the cell, and in so doing, it destroys the cell. The cell will burst open, and the viruses flood out to reinfect other cells, and this is how disease comes about. And there are many symptoms. Uh, that I'm sure that you have heard about because they've been much talked about. Uh, cough, shortness of breath, fever, uh, muscle aches, vomiting or diarrhea, which are not, not common, but it happens. And uh, one of the preludes to the disease is the loss of taste or, or smell. So these are the classic symptoms of, of uh, an infection by this particular coronavirus. And incidentally, it's called the coronavirus uh, because when you look under a microscope, those spike proteins look like a crown fitting on, on, on a head. Uh, you can also have rashes associated with uh, COVID-19. And uh, of course, you can have these rashes for numerous other reasons. So it's not always easy to uh, recognize it. But when you have the rash together with some of the other symptoms, that's how doctors can make the uh, diagnosis. There's another rare condition associated with the disease, and these are the so-called COVID toes, where the toes become red, generally because of some sort of circulatory problem, because the virus affects virtually everything in the body, including the circulatory system. How does this happen? Well, one theory is that it is actually the body's attempt to fight off the virus uh, by invoking the immune system. And uh, one of the important chemicals in the immune system is something called a cytokine. And uh, this marshals the immune cells to go into action against the virus. But sometimes there is too much action. And it is actually the, the immune uh, process itself that causes the problem. This has been a pervasive theory, but like everything else with this virus, it, it is being called into question. 
And the cytokine storm theory now is being replaced by the bradykinin storm theory. So uh, there's something new that, that basically comes out virtually every day uh, when it comes to this, uh, this virus. But one thing that we can say for sure is that people of all ages can indeed be infected by this, this virus, although older people and people who have various medical histories are, are more likely to be affected. It is absolutely not true that young people cannot be affected, and we are seeing more and more young people today uh, who are being affected by this, uh, this disease. And uh, uh, unfortunately, young people think that they are somehow immune and that illness is only for you know, old folks in their 30s, and uh, there are many, many young people who are in hospital now with COVID-19. Well, how does anyone know whether or not you have contracted the, the virus? The only way to know this is through testing. And there are several different kinds of tests. The one that you've heard about most, the nucleic acid test, this is the one where they stick uh, a swab up your nose and uh, send it off to a lab. And this will tell you whether or not uh, the virus is active in your body because they're detecting the actual genetic material that it uses to infect cells. And it's a rather unpleasant process where they stick the, uh, this uh, swab up your nose, grind it around a little bit, and send it off to the lab. And uh, this is not a quick test. It, it actually takes several hours to do the test by a machine that is called a PCR machine, a uh, polymerase chase reaction uh, machine. And you usually get the results back in, in, in a couple of, of days. Now, there's a faster test, which is the antigen test, which doesn't look for the genetic material, but it looks for fragments of the spike protein, the viral uh, protein. And uh, this uh, uh, has a great deal of potential because it is much faster and it uses uh, essentially a strip onto which uh, uh, some saliva is, is placed and uh, you eventually get a, a color change. Uh, unfortunately, it's not quite as reliable, but it is getting better and better. Uh, if you have a positive result, uh, it uh, is accepted to be uh, confirmatory for an infection, but a negative result, uh, you get too many false negatives. So that would have to be confirmed by the more sensitive uh, PCR test that we just uh, uh, talked about. But this is an evolving technology, and I think it is conceivable that in the near future, we will have a home test uh, that will tell you whether or not there's active infection. Then there's the antibody test. And uh, this detects if a person has had a prior infection. Because whenever uh, there's a virus or a bacterium that has affected our body, the body mounts an immune reaction and generates antibodies. And these antibodies then try to neutralize the uh, invader. And the antibody tests for the, for the presence of these. But all it means is that you have been exposed at some time in the past. You may not have any kind of active virus at, uh, at that given time. It's a relatively simple test. It's a pinprick test. They take a little bit of blood sample. But again, it requires a, a laboratory analysis. This is much more important for epidemiologists to know because this is one way that uh, one can monitor how this disease is, is being spread around. Uh, it doesn't do all that much for the patient because the only thing that it will tell you is that you may once have been exposed to, uh, to this uh, virus. There's also the question of the accuracy of these tests and uh, uh, some of them are more accurate than others. There are two parameters that are measured, the sensitivity, and that is how often uh, do you get a correct answer for a positive result. And the specificity is how often you get a, a correct interpretation for a negative result. And of course, one would want to see 100% in both of these categories, but that is rarely the case. But the higher the percentage that is quoted, the better the test uh, is. How is this transmitted? Well, we know, coughs and sneezes, spew out these droplets and the virus is found in these droplets. The larger the droplets are, the faster they fall to the floor due to gravity. But the real problem here is the very small droplets. How far do they spread? And again, we're learning more and more here because some of them have been um, uh, detected up to 26 uh, feet away. Of course, what 
we also have to take into account is not only the presence, but how many of these viral particles are present in a droplet. So although it is true that they can spread very far, uh, the very small droplets, you know, at 26 feet would be unlikely to contain uh, an amount of virus that is infective. Not impossible, but uh, unlikely. We've seen uh, uh, certainly epidemiologically that people who sing in choirs, for example, will spread the virus and, and they're not touching each other. Uh, they're not even breathing on each other. Uh, they can just be in the same room because just the exhaled breath can contain enough virus. We've seen this also in meatpacking plants where people work closely together in these telephone uh, answering uh, places, again, uh, close proximity, and in restaurants. This is a classic case uh, in China where they mapped the people who eventually became infected. Uh, in this picture, A1 is the person who uh, had the original infection on January 24th. And uh, others were infected, even though they were not right next to the uh, person. But because of the way the air flowed in the restaurant, uh, the uh, viral particles were carried. And we know also that we now have outbreaks in, in bars and places where people have gathered uh, indoors. And again, this is a function of the uh, specific kind of ventilation or the lack of, of ventilation. And this is something, of course, that we don't like to see, uh, that um, uh, people who have recently been diagnosed with an infection are more likely to have eaten in restaurants. And indoor is really the, uh, the problem here. Uh, there's also the question of whether or not it, this virus can spread through fecal matter. There's no evidence of anyone having been infected by uh, fecal matter. But it's interesting that, that you can detect remnants of the virus in feces, and this can give authorities uh, an idea of whether or not there is anyone in the building who has been infected. And universities are trying to, to track infections like this just by checking the, the sewage to see if there are any viral particles uh, in there. A lot of questions are asked about surface transmission, that is touching something, uh, whether or not you can pick up the virus in, in this fashion. And uh, the fact is that you can find remnants of, of the virus on surfaces. Uh, this article that got a lot of publicity originally published in the New England Journal of Medicine showed that on copper surface, the, the virus, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus, they, lives for a very short time, longer on cardboard, longer on stainless steel, and, and for days on, on plastic. However, this is, is not indicative of what happens in the real world because the amount of virus that they used to do this test that they put on a surface was way more than anything that people would encounter. So uh, most experts now say that, that uh, uh, transmission through fomites, which is inanimate objects, is very unlikely. Not impossible if someone sneezed on a surface and you touch the surface and then you touch your nose, it can happen but that is a very, very unlikely means of, of transmission. Nevertheless, people have become fanatical about spraying surfaces. They spray them with bleach, they spray them with hydrogen peroxide, they spray them with alcohol. Each of these will disinfect the surface. But as I said, this is, is not, not critical. Uh, I actually like the hydrogen peroxide spray. Uh, it is uh, less irritating than spraying, uh, spraying with bleach, and it will take care of any virus that you may have uh, on a surface. But uh, in fact, the truth is that just washing with soap and water is also uh, uh, generally good enough to uh, clean your uh, surface. Washing of fruits and vegetables, as some people do, I think is totally unnecessary. All you have to do is put them under the tap. You don't have to use soap or anything like that. Uh, as far as takeout containers go, I don't worry about handling them. The chance that there's infective dose of virus on there is, is infinitesimal. Uh, but what you wanna do is wash your hands after handling just about anything. And you know, that this is the advice that has not altered. And uh, the more often you wash your hands after handling any kind of suspect material, the less likely you are to uh, contact the, uh, the virus. Uh, but I don't think you need to be fanatical at all about uh, washing your groceries, and I, I certainly uh, don't to do that. 
You've probably seen pictures of large-scale disinfectant spraying, uh, this kind of thing in, in China. Uh, this is totally unnecessary and probably is, is counterproductive. What they are using is calcium hypochlorite, which is bleach. Uh, it's quite irritating, which of course is why they wear all their protective uh, equipment. But we also have evidence that it doesn't do anything because you don't get this by touching, you know, the pavement outside. Uh, there have been, you know, some rare cases where someone may have picked up the virus from touching an elevator button. But again, this is, is uh, so rare that, that uh, it doesn't merit all this attention. So this kind of random spraying is not uh, advisable. One uh, object, though, that, that does carry a lot of microbes, not necessarily uh, the, the uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, virus, bacteria also, and these are cell phones because we handle them often, we put them down on all kinds of surfaces, other people may pick them up as, as well. It's a good idea to keep these clean, and there's a device actually that can do this, and it does it with ultraviolet light. Um, you can't get them these days because they're all sold out, but actually it does work. And the ultraviolet light does take care of the of this virus. I don't think it's critical. I think you can do a very good job just by uh, wiping it uh, with a wet wipe. Uh, just follow the manufacturer's instructions. But the iPhone is very hardy, and and you can uh, just uh, wipe it. Of course, one of the most important questions that comes up is prevention. What do we do? to make sure that we don't get infected. Uh, monitoring temperature is one thing, uh, because of course it's one of the first uh, uh, symptoms of, of an infection, but you can be infected and not have a high fever. So uh, while this may be indicative, it certainly is not foolproof. Uh, it is certainly safe. You may have seen this ridiculous story that goes around together with the video that, that exposing the body to infrared light is going to somehow affect the pineal gland in the center of your brain and wreak havoc. Uh, this is nonsense uh, in, in, in many ways. First of all, these infrared thermometers do not radiate anything. They just pick up infrared radiation. Infrared radiation is just heat. So these are just detectors. They do not put out anything. Sometimes they will have a beam of visible light so that the, the operator knows where, where they're shining it. But this is just total nonsense. But there's so much nonsense out there on, on the internet. Well, of course, lockdown is a way of preventing it, but it's a, that's a pretty you know, strong arm uh, tactic, but it does work. And social distancing, which really should be called physical distancing, we don't want to socially distance from people, we want to physically distance, that, that works. And we're getting used to this. And, you know, we're getting used to the X's on the subways and on the buses and in, in, in restaurants to make sure that we're two meters away. There are people who are coming up with all kinds of ingenious ways to, to make sure that we're not exposed to each other's uh, breath. You can go to, into a gym and work inside one of these cubicles. School children are working in, in cubicles. And sometimes uh, uh, grandparents who want to hug their children will go to all kinds of extremes in order to keep safe. I think that's a little bit extreme. I, I think that a quick hug uh, by a grandparent is, is not uh, risky. I mean, you don't want to be uh, kissing and spending a lot of time you know, in close proximity, but just a quick hug, I, I, I think the, the chance of, of uh, contracting the virus like that is, is uh, is very, very small because uh, the time frame is important. The amount of virus that may be in the, uh, in the breath is, is important. So this, this is not, uh, to me, a, a big issue. Uh, believe it or not, uh, TV programs also have to, to try to prevent, of course, the spread of infection. And uh, so kissing and sex scenes are, are being put on a hold. And uh, The Bold and the Beautiful, which is the most popular soap operas out there, has resorted to using mannequins for kissing scenes. And uh, this, of course, is going to uh, result in some pretty good ratings because people want to see exactly how they manage to, to do this. Other programs are also using mannequins uh, in scenes uh, such as this. And of course, when the camera is far enough away and the camera is moving, you don't pick up the fact that they're actually using mannequins. So this is really affecting every area of our life. Of course, the 
protective scheme that is being talked about the most now is the mask. And uh, it shouldn't be as controversial as it is because we have ample evidence now that masking works. Not only does it protect someone else from you, it also protects you from someone else because the mask can capture the large particles that are exhaled and the small particles that may uh, get to you from someone else, well, the mask may not totally protect against that, but it does protect some, somewhat. So there's no reason not to wear a mask. Uh, of course, when you're outdoors, that's a completely different story. But when you're indoors in an environment where there's a lot of people, uh, masking uh, uh, should be done. And we are getting more and more publications uh, about this, uh, about uh, fact that masking works. Uh, we're getting good data, this one in the New England Journal of Medicine. For example, they talk about uh, on a cruise ship where the uh, passengers and, and the crew were provided with, with masks. Now, there was still some infection, but the infection was much, much less problematic because, as you can see, 81% of the people who did get infected were asymptomatic. And only about 20% uh, when there is no masking. And if you want some further evidence, here's a, a study that was just published where they looked at the Syrian hamster, and which is a very good model for how viruses get transmitted. And it turns out that when they infected some hamsters with the virus and they had other hamsters wear masks, they didn't get infected. Well, to tell you the truth, they didn't really do it exactly like this. Uh, they had the hamsters that were infected in one cage. The control hamsters were in a cage beside them, and the, that cage was either covered or not covered with the same material of which masks are made. And when it was covered, it turned out that the hamsters did not get uh, the infection. So we are having more and more evidence about masks. They work. Of course, there are all kinds of masks out there. There are some that are advertised to be especially effective because they contain antiviral particles like zinc oxide uh, or the copper masks. None of these have been documented to actually reduce the spread of disease. It is true that when you put the virus on the mask, it may um, become less viable. But no one has shown that wearing these specific masks is uh, better than wearing any other mask. The important thing is to wear the mask. These face shields, again, which are being uh, promoted, are not as effective as masks. Because of course, the air can circulate uh, inside of them. But it's uh, obviously better than nothing. And some people are wearing the shields and the masks. And some people don't wear the mask at all, even though the science, of course, is very clear that masking works and that it should be uh, promoted. You can even make it a fashion statement. And of course, there's a whole industry that has risen around the making of, of, of masks. Some people overdo it. Uh, I don't think that you have to cover yourself from head to toe. Uh, in order to protect yourself, but some people overdo it on both sides. There are those who say that masking doesn't work. Uh, this uh, uh, hearing, which was in Florida, uh, this lady who was against wearing a mask because it interferes for, with her freedom, also said that she doesn't wear underwear because she wants everything on her body to breathe. I mean, pretty ridiculous stuff. Uh, and uh, there's a movement now, my body, my choice, no mask, no one's going to tell me what to do. There are demonstrations like this. Uh, just this week in the U.S., they're holding a mask burning ceremony. Terrible business. And uh, they often point uh, to Sweden, where uh, there has not been an enforced lockdown. And they say, look, you know, the, the lockdown and the masking doesn't work. Just look at Sweden. Well, the fact is that the Swedes are very different from North Americans, and uh, they abide by advisories. And while there was no enforced lockdown in Sweden, there was a lot of advice about staying away from each other. And the Swedes do this anyway. This is how they normally line up at, uh, at a bus stop. And uh, even though, uh, you know, there, uh, there are these stories about, uh, you know, how Sweden has not suffered, the statistics don't bear that out. Uh, Sweden actually has a very high death rate from coronavirus. Uh, but uh, the people who are out there demonstrating against uh, masks, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, will just cherry pick whatever data they think is important for their cause. Uh, this notion that, that oxygen is essential and that the mask impairs your ability to inhale oxygen is nonsense. That has been shown not to be true. Uh, unless you have some severe respiratory problem, the mask does not impair uh, oxygen. And not only that, these people also are demonstrating uh, ridiculous notions. Uh, they support things like QAnon, uh, this um, idiotic uh, conspiracy theory that there's some sort of satanic, pedophilic organization run by George Soros and Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama, who are trying to bring down the uh, American uh, government. And on top of it, uh, they have uh, cannibalistic uh, tendencies. This kind of thing just makes me want to pull my hair out. When you see this, uh, and we know what the real science is, and you have these nuts marching in the street, uh, telling us that COVID is not real and that we should not be wearing uh, masks. What they are really doing is causing an increase in infections because they are just spreading the virus around because many of them are probably asymptomatically carrying the virus. But what about treatments? Are there any? Unfortunately, there's a great deal of quackery out there, misrepresentation of all kinds of, of, of stuff. Now, back in uh, 1919, uh, there was quackery then too. As you can see, all kinds of claims being made for miracle uh, products. Uh, Horlicks malted milk was supposed to be uh, the thing to take to, to prevent the disease. Today, we're seeing all kinds of stuff. Uh, when the uh, epidemic first presented, we're told to insert cotton soaked in oil of violet in, in your anus. I have been getting letters from a doctor, believe it or not, pushing a lavender supplement. And although he's very careful with the wording that he uses, uh, when I check him out, I find out that he's into chelation therapy and, and uh, all kinds of non nonsense. And uh, of course, the lavender pills are, they may smell very nice, but they will do nothing for COVID-19. Then we have people like Alex Jones pushing various kinds of silver treatments. Well, Alex Jones also thinks uh, that there are all kinds of conspiracies uh, out there. And uh, uh, there's no conspiracy th theory that he doesn't buy into. Bill Gates, for example, of all people, has given millions and millions uh, to help uh, fight disease. He says he's trying to kill off the population to thin out uh, the world. Alex Jones, of course, also thinks that Michelle Obama is actually a man. Uh, so uh, there are these idiotic notions out there. <clears throat> and they will promote various kinds of, of products. In this particular case, MMS, Miracle Mineral Solution, uh, which basically is uh, chlorine dioxide. It is a good industrial bleach if you want to clean up paper. <laughs> it should never be put into the body. But this is the, the story that Trump uh, supposedly heard when he uh, asked uh, Dr. Bricks on TV whether or not uh, it would be possible to treat COVID-19 with a disinfectant by injecting it into people. And this, of course, gave rise to all kinds of cartoons. It was total nonsense. You, you cannot rid the body of the virus by injecting it with, with bleach. Neither can you do anything by zapping it with copper. This copper probe, supposedly, you put up your nose to kill the virus. Well, uh, the virus is not only in your nose. By the time that it goes into your nose, it will very quickly spread your mucus tissues. You're not going to do anything with these copper probes. In China, uh, there are all kinds of remedies as well. This interesting one is actually made from the pangolin. And it has almost driven the animal to extinction. This is the same pangolin that has been implicated in causing the disease. Of course, there's no evidence that these powders do anything. Uh, even more disturbing is bear bile. And in China, they actually raise bears in captivity and they milk them for their bowel. These animals are forced to live in these cages for their life. It's, it's a horrific thing. And it's animal torture. And they, the bile doesn't have any kind of medical uh, effect at all. Uh, there's also uh, the homeopathic advocates. Uh, homeopathic remedies, of course, are diluted to the extent that they contain nothing. Uh, so this is nothing more than a placebo. And placebos, of course, do not cure viral infections. 
So there's a lot of nonsense out there. Then there are a lot of questionable approaches as well. Hydroxychloroquine, uh, this is this product that was uh, embraced and pushed by, by Trump, in spite of the fact that there's no evidence. Uh, as you can see here, benefits of these drugs do not outweigh their risks. And studies keep coming about how tests have been done, and it just doesn't do what uh, people have said that it does. There are even doctors out there uh, who claim that hydroxychloroquine is somehow being hidden from the public by the deep state. This is just ridiculous, but it just goes to show you that higher education is not a vaccine against stupidity. Uh, Michael uh, Undell, you probably know from the late night infomercials where he sells pillows. Well, he was able to get a meeting with Trump and push oleander, which he believes is the answer. It's extracted from the oleander plant. Well, luckily, experts have very quickly rejected this, even though Harp, uh, Trump said that he is going to look into it as if he had any expertise in looking into things. In Ontario, researchers are now looking into the acai berry, although there's no evidence that, that it has any antiviral properties. And uh, this is a berry. It looks something like a blueberry. It grows in South America. And they're actually mounting a study. They have registered a study. They're going to look into it because the fruit does have some antioxidants, but there's no evidence it has any antiviral properties. So we're going to find out if this is for the birds or not. I suspect that there's not going to be anything significant coming out of uh, the, this study. Uh, there are some researchers, uh, in this case, uh, Michel Chrétien, who's the brother of our former prime minister and a very legitimate researcher. They're looking into quercetin, which is found in many fruits and vegetables. And uh, it does have anti-inflammatory and immune uh, properties. Uh, it's available as a supplement. But again, there's no hard evidence. Neither is there any hard, hard evidence for zinc supplements, although zinc does play a role in the immune system. So there may be something to this. If you are totally deficient in zinc, which in North America is very unlikely, zinc excess can also be a problem. Uh, there's a lot of talk about zinc, and I suspect many of you have seen uh, Dr. Joshua Ritchie's video, which is going around. He's a very legitimate physician. He played a role in, in uh, elucidating the role of uh, vitamin E in premature babies, uh, the benefits. But he hasn't published anything for about 30 years. But now he's got this video out there promoting zinc supplements. Well, the question I would ask is, show us the evidence. There isn't any. It's just talk. Now, I can't say that zinc supplements don't do anything because zinc is part of the immune system, but we have no evidence that taking these supplements has any benefit at all. There are people who are loading up on vitamin C, sometimes even using it intravenously, again, with no evidence whatsoever. But you know, when science doesn't have a clear answer, this is when all these questionable remedies come into play. So what is there for which we have some significant evidence? We do have evidence for dexamethasone, which is a, a steroid. It's anti-inflammatory. This, of course, is used only in hospitals for someone who has serious symptoms. Remdesivir is an antiviral drug. Again, hospital use with people who have severe symptoms. And uh, more and more research is showing that anticoagulants, like aspirin or, or coumadin or uh, heparin, uh, can reduce the complications that are associated with, uh, with COVID but more research is needed here. Uh, vitamin D is another one that has potential. Uh, vitamin D, of course, is, is well known because of deficiency results in rickets. Uh, we know that when we're exposed to the sun, the body forms vitamin D. But the question is, is it enough? Vitamin D does play a role in immunity. And uh, studies are showing that um, in countries where there is vitamin D deficiency, usually from lack of sunshine, there's a great incidence of certain diseases, inc including COVID. So I, I think taking a vitamin D supplement is not a bad idea, especially in Canada in the winter where we don't get very much exposure to the sun. 
And uh, we are getting some uh, you know, interesting research about vitamin D. In this case, as you can see, almost 500 patients, they had their vitamin D level measured. And uh, it turned out that the ones who had low levels were more likely to eventually be uh, positive for COVID-19. And I don't think there's any risk in taking you know, 400 to 1,000 IU of, of uh, vitamin uh, uh, D. There's a lot of uh, excitement about convalescent plasma. Plasma is the liquid uh, that stays behind when you take blood and you centrifuge it and the blood cells uh, fall to the bottom. And uh, if someone has previously been infected by COVID-19, the plasma will have antibodies. So the idea is to take these antibodies out of the plasma and inject these into a, a patient who has been blood matched with the, with the donor so that the antibodies will neutralize the virus before it has a chance to interact with the ACE2 inhibitors and, or with the ACE2 receptors. And this uh, got a lot of publicity when the uh, head of the uh, uh, FDA, Stephen Hahn, uh, promoted this and said that there was a 35% reduction in mortality in people who were treated with, with plasma. This was a totally misleading and wrong statistic because what he was looking at here was the relative risk, not the absolute risk. He looked at the percentage by which the risk was reduced, which is really not the way to, to look at it. Uh, I, to give you a very simple idea, if you buy a lottery ticket, you know you, that you have a small chance of winning. If you buy two lottery tickets, you've increased your chance by 100%, but you still have a very small chance of winning. So the important thing is the absolute risk. And in this case, the absolute risk was, was much, much smaller. Uh, 4.8 lives would be safe for every 100 patients treated, which is not irrelevant. Uh, but again, this has to be further confirmed because the National Institutes of Health in the U.S. has said that we don't have enough evidence for the use of convalescent plasma. But there's a lot of research being done, much of it being done here at McGill, and uh, we will see uh, what happens. Of course, the big hope that is held out is for the vaccine. And I think that an awful lot of eggs being put in this uh, basket. And uh, uh, I hope those eggs are fertile and that they will eventually hatch, but there are a lot of questions to, to ask here. Uh, all of these vaccines uh, are based on somehow dealing with the spike protein because this is the, the, the protein that it uses to infect the cell. So for example, what you want to do is force the body to produce antibodies that will then interact with those spike proteins and, and neutralize it. And there are several ways that this can be done. For example, you obviously don't want to inject a, a live virus into, into a person to trigger antibodies. But there are ways that you can attenuate or inactivate the virus. There are chemicals that you can use to, to rid it of its genetic machinery. So it still retains the spike proteins, but it cannot reproduce. That's one possible uh, mechanism. Very early on in this COVID-19 story, Chinese researchers decoded the genome of the virus so that we know its exact genetics. And that has allowed them to use the genes that code for the production of that spike protein, insert that gene into a bacterium, and the bacterium will then produce this protein, which can be injected into a person and generate antibodies. So this is what is called the subunit protein vaccine, and this is the one that most researchers are, are looking at. There's also the possibility of using a different kind of uh, a virus, one that does not replicate in the human body. And uh, there's a virus that, that is found in chimpanzees that doesn't replicate in the human body, but which can have inserted into its genome the code that will force it to make the spike protein, and the body then will develop immunity to it. This is the one that is being used by the so-called Oxford study and the AstraZeneca study, and unfortunately, last week, there was a stumbling block here when someone developed a, a, a first symptom and they had to stop it for a while, the study, but they have now restarted it again. And this has a lot of potential. This is the same one that supposedly the Russians are using to develop their vaccine, but we just don't know enough about them because they don't release enough uh, information. But the, the one that uh, is uh, generating a lot of uh, interest here in North America 
uh, are the nucleic acid vaccines. And uh, these involve actually injecting either DNA or RNA into, into a person. And this has uh, been genetically engineered so that it will produce the spike protein. And then the body develops antibodies to it. So far, there have been no such drugs that have been put on the market, but this is what Moderna is working on. And uh, this has a lot of potential because when you inject uh, this RNA into the body, it will give the body instructions to for form the spike protein, and then that will trigger the generation of antibodies. But of course, all of this right now is in the preliminary stage, and there are concerns that, that there's a bit too much of a rush, that not enough testing has been done, that there are not the phase three trials that we really want to see. Yeah, they've done the phase one trials, which involve a small number of subjects, just to study whether or not the thing is safe. Uh, some have done phase two studies where you use several hundred subjects and you give them different dosage and see whether or not there's a response. This can take up to two years. Two years have not passed. And then the most important are the phase three studies where you employ several thousand subjects to evaluate efficacy and long-term safety. It can take up to four years. Well, the phase two studies today have been shortened and uh, now they're into the phase three. Uh, there are some shortcuts being taken here, but we are assured that the shortcuts are, are reasonable. Uh, and um, Trump, of course, has hinted that we're going to have a vaccine by uh, election day, uh, but he's playing politics. And the biopharma leaders just a couple of days ago have gotten together and said that they are not going to be influ influenced by politics. Science is going to rule. Uh, we shall see. Uh, there's hope out there that we will have a vaccine. As I just described to you, the technology is understood. Uh, we know how vaccines can be manufactured. And you can shorten the manufacturing time. You can even shorten the research time. But you're, you're uh, playing with safety when you try to shorten the time that it's given to humans <coughs> to study side effects and long-term efficacy. In order to really know, that takes years. So we're unfortunately going to be looking at this problem for a while. What is happening now? <clears throat> well, here in, in, in Canada, we're not doing too bad. As you can see, the incidence is, is kind of level. In the U.S., uh, they had, of course, catastrophic uh, uh, results, but it is decreasing there as well as uh, you know, uh, more and more people are paying attention to uh, physical distancing, but uh, the U.S. numbers are still, as you can see, about uh, 10 times higher than uh, seen anywhere else. Uh, it's easy to be seduced by simple but wrong answers and saying, you know, that masking doesn't work. Uh, I mean, that's a simple solution to the problem. You can just then ignore the problem. But this is like playing ostrich and putting your head into the sand. The fact is that, that the, the route to find an answer to COVID-19 uh, is very complex and circuitous, and it's going to take time. Uh, but there's hope. There's hope. Uh, uh, it's not going to be tomorrow or next week or next month, but better treatments will come, and eventually we'll have a vaccine. Of course, we will have to make sure that enough people take the vaccine. Because even if we have a vaccine that is 90% effective, which is about as much as you can hope for, but we have 30% of the population who is not going to be willing to take the vaccine, then you're already below the potential of herd immunity. So we need education on top of the vaccine. In the meantime, unfortunately, all we can do is uh, social distance, stay outside as much as, as, uh, as possible, and uh, hope that we will have the treatment and the vaccine will come around. But unfortunately, it's not just around the corner. We will keep you up to date on our website, uh, which is mcgill.ca slash OSS. And of course, you can always email me. And there you see my email address. So I hope I've been able to give you kind of a cursor view here of where we stand. And uh, it's not all doom and gloom. Uh, there is some light at the end of the tunnel. But uh, unfortunately, it is a very long tunnel.
So thanks very much. And uh, I don't know if we have a minute or two to answer any questions, but if we do, we can certainly do that. With all the fake news that are out there, what are some sources that could actually be trusted for people that are, don't know the difference between a good source and a bad source? Well, I think Health Canada can be trusted. The CDC, Centers for Disease Control in the U.S., can be uh, trusted. Uh, an excellent website called Science-Based Medicine can be trusted. And I hope that our website can be, uh, can be trusted. But there's, like you say, there's a lot of nonsense out there uh, and um, all these conspiracy theories. And they, they do a lot of harm. I mean, you know, all the, this uh, anti-masking propaganda is going to result in increased number of infections. Actually, I see one question. Any idea of a realistic time frame for a vaccine? That's from Lynn. It's a very a good question. Uh, you know, it depends on how you look at it. I, I think we will have the rollout of one or even more uh, vaccines relatively soon. Uh, we'll probably will have something that appears, you know, with, within a few months. But it doesn't mean that we will know how effective and how safe it is. Uh, because the testing has not been long enough to or just to determine that. But it's going to be rolled out because we are dealing here with, you know, a very unusual situation and it's sort of an emergency. Uh, so uh, there will be some vaccines that are rolled out without having the long term testing. Uh, I think the chances are that they will reasonably be safe because as a general rule, when a side effect to a vaccine shows up, it shows up within a month or two. It's, it's not years later. Uh, but. Uh, my, my guess is that in order to have uh, a vaccine that we know is safe and effective and that will be able to be produced in, in uh, uh, enough doses to give to billions of people, which is what is going to be needed, we're looking at two, three years. We have uh, lived through terrible times in our history before with the epidemics and pandemics, and we have come through it. We will come through this as well. Uh, but, uh, you know, we have to be vigilant and abide by the uh, expert views. And right now, the expert view is that, that we uh, don't gather indoors in large numbers and that uh, when you go into shopping centers and stores, you do wear your, your mask and um, be outside as much as possible. Uh, unfortunately, for the restaurant business, this is not going to be very good because uh, I, I think there's just legitimate reason not to be indoors, you know, under those circumstances uh, where you cannot, you don't know how the airflow is, you don't know who is, you know, even if it's not literally the next table, even if it's a table away. Uh, so uh, I think home cooking for now is the way to go. By the time that a vaccine is put on the market so that it will be available to people, I think that enough research has been done so that the benefits outweigh the risk. But there's always going to be some, some risk. But there's not going to be a vaccine that is put out there on the market uh, unless we have a very good idea of the risk-benefit uh, profile. Uh, I, I think that uh, in this case, science will trump the politics.